Yes, uh, once again, good morning. We shall begin uh, this uh, webinar session. It's exactly five minutes past 11 a.m. We shall begin this uh, webinar session with an opening prayer and I will request a volunteer to give us uh, an opening prayer. Then we can proceed with our agenda for today's webinar session. Yes, any a volunteer on the call to get in an opening prayer, then we proceed. Hi. Hello. Uh, let's Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we bless you for such a wonderful day. We thank you for this webinar that was prepared to brighten our minds, to awaken our minds about the Miro and the future of Uganda's land tenure system. We pray for our presenters that, Lord, you give them the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding they need to do this presentation, that people shall come out well aware, people shall come out well informed in the mighty name of Jesus. We also pray for the people that are listening, that Lord, we shall listen and pick something to go and educate the masses instead of arguing that, uh, instead of joining the arguing forces. Father, we bless you, we give you the praise in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, uh, once again, I welcome all of you uh, for the, for this webinar session. Uh, uh, it's been organized by MAS, Mathieu University Association of Serving Students. Yes, and uh, MAS is the body that uh, brings together students for the for those that uh, might not be well covered at with MAS. It's uh, the Mathieu University Association of Serving Students, and uh, it's a body that brings together students from offering bachelors of quantity surveying and land economics and land surveying. Uh, at the School of Built Environment, uh, College of Engineering, Design, Art and Technology, Macquarie University. And MAS is also affiliated to the Institution of Surveyors of Uganda, that is uh, ISU. So uh, moving further with uh, our agenda today, uh, we shall be, I'll proceed to, intro to introduce the session aims and goals. Then I'll invite uh, the moderator to, to pick up from there. So, uh, right, uh, this is the topic, current state of Mayo land and the future of Uganda's land tenure system. So the aims of the webinar, one is to mentor the seven students as they pursue their careers, inspire, and also motivate uh, the students as uh, they pursue their career, their certain career. Uh, yes, uh, then the session goals, uh, what we expect at the end of this webinar, uh, is uh, want to know if there is a possibility of abolishing Milo land. Uh, what effect could uh, the possible abolition of uh, Milo land have on the careers of land surveyors and uh, other surveyors in general? Then what, what, what next for the landlords and the tenants occupying land under uh, this tenure? And then we shall also expect to hear from our presenters uh, what lies ahead of Uganda's land tenure system uh, regarding the, the stories that have been going ar around uh, of abolishing Milo land. So at uh, this point, I will invite two more generals, our moderator, to take us through the rest of the agenda. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, 
thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Shomolo Generals Nagir. I'm the Vice President, Matt. And today I'll be introducing the keynote speaker for today. Yeah, we'll be having RSU Edrisa. We'll be having RSU Edrisa Cabrisa talking to us first. Thank you so much for sparing your time to speak to us. He's a senior land surveyor. He's an RSU registered with the Surveyors Registration Board. He's a professional member of the Institution of Surveyors of Uganda. He's the ISU representative to FIG on FIG Commission, which deals with cadastral land management. He's also a member of the Cedar Alumni Association Steering Committee representing the surveyors. So from all this, we all know that he's very knowledgeable and we really thank him for taking up his time to speak to us. Yeah, RSU Edu Sakabisa, the platform is all yours. So before he takes up the platform, I think let me also introduce the second keynote speaker such that if Immediately he's done, he can take us through as well. So the second keynote speaker is RSU Kizito Basho Juma. He's registered with the Institution of Surveyors of Uganda as well as the Surveyors Registration Board. He's a fellow, which is the a fellow at the Institution of the Surveyors of Uganda. He's currently the head of department operations, business development, and corporate affairs at Uganda Land Board, the district land surveyor of Nakaseke District. Acting District Self Surveyor at Wakiso District. He's the personal attorney to the Kavaka of Uganda. Wow, amazing. And he's also, and he has experience spanning over 18 years in the areas of engineering survey, cadastral surveying, and land administration and management. Don't forget, he's the co director of the Power Survey Consult Limited, a private survey firm. So, all our RSUs speaking to us are very, very, very much more knowledgeable. So, please. Pay attention to what they are saying. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. And let's hear from RSU in this second. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jen Rose. Uh, I hope I can be heard. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kabiswa Edilisa, land surveyor, registered with the Surveyors Registration Board. I am very delighted to be invited here uh, to share my knowledge and experiences on this topic, uh, especially given this time when uh, government seems to be mooting uh, very drastic uh, Myeloland tenure reforms. Uh, to me, this is another opportunity to serve the School of the Built Environment, which I served way back as its pioneer GRC in the Guild House. It's an honor to come back home to share my knowledge and experiences in the land sector. And perhaps the reason I was invited this time round is because I'm currently an undergraduate student, like many of you, only that we are pursuing different courses. I am in my final year at Makerere University School of Law, offering a Bachelor of Laws. And therefore, my presentation will focus on marrying the perspective of surveyors on the question of mild tenure in Uganda and the position of the law. Uh, before we delve into that, we need to take a look back at the historical uh, perspective of, uh, of, of mild tenure. Uh, we need to note that uh, prior to the 1900 Uganda Agreement, all land in Uganda was under the control of kindred groups and chiefs. Whereas the Kabaka appointed the chiefs, the heads of kindred groups were appointed by members and only confirmed by the Kabaka. 
This therefore meant that all control over land in Uganda was ultimately with the Kabaka. And it was controlled under four uh, different ways, three different ways, which you can uh, approximate to 10 years, you can say. Uh, so we had the Butaka land, we had the Butongole land, we had uh, the Wesenze land, and I will explain that. Uh, so Butaka land was characterized by uh, rights being exercised by each of the clan heads, all of whom were known as the Butaka, or which is translated to mean land chiefs. To the Waganda, Butaka was the traditional, traditional home, traditional land of the, king, of the kinship and any member of the kindred group. And therefore, each and every member claimed rights, at the very least, burial rights in the land. And uh, at most, uh, they, they used the land and also stayed on the land. The clan heads exercised the right of allocation and use uh, derogation for use of the land to the clan members. And you should note that at that time, the concept of sale uh, was not known, the sale of land was not known in Uganda. So upon the death of the clan head, this land would be passed whole without any subdivision to the successor. And the successor was chosen by the clan elders. Uh, however, sometimes the, 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 the the mutaka, the, 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 the chief would point at the person, usually a, a male, that they would want to take over from them on their demise. However, that appointment would not take effect without the personal presentation and confirmation of the kabaka. So it goes back to uh, say that the kabaka was the was the, the servant of the person with the ultimate control over land. land was granted by the Kawaka to his greater chiefs, or the Bakungu, to whom the administration of the counties was entrusted. This managed these estates through the lesser chiefs, known as the, uh, as the Batongole. And some of this land was used for construction of administrative offices, or what they called in Uganda, Mbukaza Masaza. The chiefs had the power to allocate part of this land to the subjects for cultivation and settlement. The rights of Tongole, however, were not hereditary rights and would cease immediately the person ceased to hold the office of uh, either Mutongole uh, or Mukungu. And that meant that uh, the, the longest time the person would hold this estate is a lifetime on death, it would move to the, to the next uh, officer appointed by the Kabaka. The third uh, type of tenure, which was also less prevalent in Uganda was uh, the Owe Sengeze land. Uh, these were hereditary private land rights obtained either through long occupation or, or a particular small holding confirmed by the Kabaka or a grant by the Kabaka of the same to a chief or a peasant. Uh, whereas these holdings were generally very small, uh, they were regarded as very valuable as they were inheritable and carried with them no political duties. Uh, having seen the three, uh, uh, the three tenures, we need now to, where did the Chivanja come from? So the Chivanja in this context was, uh, was, uh, uh, I have I've just said that uh, all the three all the three land managers above were called land chiefs, and those chiefs used to grant settlement and user rights to the peasants. So that that they used to grant the, the peasants is what is uh, known as the chivanja. So chivanja is not a concept of yesterday. Chivanja is a uh, is a uh, a traditional concept in Uganda. 
Uh, having seen that, we need to look at, at uh, how the Baganda understood and valued land uh, before the 1900 Buganda agreement. So to the Baganda, land itself had no intrinsic value. The land was a source of power and wealth by the chief in terms of the number of, of, of uh, services of the peasants you could, read, you, you could induce to settle upon that uh, given piece of land. So the peasants would obtain vivanja on any of the, of the three tenure systems and they were not tied to the land. So they would uh, move from one, one chief to another. So a person would move from Obutaka to Obutongoli or from Obwesengeze to Obutongoli, depending on how the chief was treating uh, their subjects. So uh, whereas the chiefs had a lot of power on to, to exert on the subjects if they wanted, they would use it sparingly because they knew that uh, uh, if they did not use it uh, uh, reasonably, they would re lose all, all the tenants on the land and that meant uh, having no value in the land because the land was for what the tenants can do for you and not, not like uh, monitored in any case, in any way. So after that, there came um, a, a landmark ag agreement, the 1900 Uganda Agreement. So in March 1900, uh, the agreement was signed between the Kingdom of Uganda and uh, uh, Her Majesty, uh, and Her Majesty the Queen of England. In that, in that agreement, Uganda was estimated to be 19,600 square miles of land. And out of that, 9,000 square miles was set aside to be shared between the Kabaka, his family, um, the royal chiefs and notables in Uganda, each one getting uh, 1,000, uh, they were 1,000 and each one was uh, supposed to get eight square miles. And the rest of the land, which was categorized as uh, uncultivated, uh, wasteland um, and forests was to go under the control and management of the British crown. Each of the notable persons was allocated eight square miles, as I've said, and uh, that meant that uh, the total would be 8,000 square miles. So uh, that is the beginning of the word mile as it became uh, to be known and as, as it is known today. So mile land comes from those many square miles that were shared between uh, uh, a number of people, including the Kabaka, the, his family, the, notable, the notables and uh, the royal chiefs of the time, many of which uh, discussed and passed the, the 1900 Uganda Agreement. So this agreement is very monumental in the understanding of uh, the Mauritania in Uganda or in Uganda, because it had the effect of initiating a new land tenure system known as the mile tenure. The mile tenure is a, a quasi freehold uh, kind of tenure. So this was imposed on the people who looked at land as not for the land itself, but for what it can, it can give you, what you can get from the land. So it was a completely new uh, set of uh, arrangement. And that caused the problem, or what is usually called the mild problem. So I have uh, tried in this presentation uh, to explain what is meant by the mild problem. So the 1900 agreement caused a drastic and complete revolution in the land tenure in Uganda that had never been imagined. In Uganda, the individual proprietary rights did not evolve gradually as it is the case in the rest of the country. Rather, from the signing of the agreement, full proprietary rights of um, quasi freehold nature were introduced without explanation in a society to which 
they had not previously been known or even imagined. In 1900, uh, land distribution was discovered to have disenfranchised some sections of Uganda society, which some, with some clans and subclans wholly missing out in their allocations. The peasants too were not involved in the negotiation, although they were the vast majority at the time. Given that the grant of the near freehold estates to the individuals effectively limited the power of the government to administer land, the peasants' position was put in jeopardy. The newly introduced system of land ownership was superimposed on the existing customary land rights. This resulted in the duality of land rights. Now, the problem of Milo land is the failure to find a way to disentangle the multiple and the conflicting tenure rights and interests overlapping on the same piece of land. If you're ever asked to define what the mild problem is, that is where the problem is. So this has been at the, as identified as the major source of land conflicts within Uganda. If uh, we can move on uh, first from the historical perspective and the definition of the problem, uh, let's go straight to how the constitution and the legal framework of my land is currently in Uganda. So Milo land is a tenure, just like many other tenures, and uh, it is provided for in the constitution. Article 237 provides that land in Uganda belongs to the citizens of Uganda and shall vest in them in accordance with the land tenure systems provided for in the constitution. And those are four. They include uh, the freehold, the milo, the leasehold, and the customary tenure. Mild tenure is characterized by uh, two major incidents. Uh, that is holding of registered land in perpetuity and permitting the separation of ownership of the land from developments on the land made by lawful and bona fide occupants. Uh, so mild tenure has uh, uh, mainly three parties that are recognized by the law. There is the mild land owner, the registered proprietor of the land on the one hand, and the lawful and bona fide occupant on the other hand. So that means that it is important to understand who is the lawful occupant and who is the bona fide occupant. Of course, uh, everyone of us knows who the registered proprietor is, is the person whose name appears on the title for that particular land. So section 29 of the Land Act defines who a lawful and bona fide occupant on my land is. And uh, it defines a lawful occupant as a person occupying the land by virtue of the repealed Gusul and Mfujo law of 1928 the Tolo Landlord and Tenant Law of 1937, the Ankole Landlord and Tenant Law of 1937, and also a person who entered the land with the consent of the registered owner and includes a purchaser. Uh, the, the same law, the same provision, section 29, defines um, a bona fide occupant on the land as a person who had occupied and utilized or developed the land and challenged by the registered owner or their agent for 12 years before the coming into place of the 1995 constitution. So that means that if a person had settled in the land in 1983, and that person enjoyed undisturbed possession and uh, while they possessed the land, they developed it. 
um, that person is protected by the law as a bona fide occupant. Uh, the other category is a person who had been settled on the land by the government or an agency of government, which may include the local authority. However, the, 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 the qualifier to that is that government must compensate the registered owner whose land has been occupied by persons who settled by the government or an agency of government. So those are the three, uh, uh, the three parties that are recognized by the Land Act as, uh, uh, as parties to Milo land. The exclusion, which is uh, uh, boldly set out in the law, is uh, the person who is a licensee. And uh, the licensee is a person, uh, for example, if uh, you have my land and you allow someone to go and cultivate or own the land, uh, seasonal cultivation, give them like uh, three years to, to cultivate on the land, that person cannot claim to be a lawful or bona fide, bona fide occupant because it's just a license. He entered there on uh, your permission, on your terms. So, another clarification or inclusion in the definition of lawful and bona fide occupant is that any person who has purchased or otherwise acquired the interest of the person qualified to be a bona fide occupant under this section shall be taken to be a bona fide occupant of the land. I think that is very clear. If you buy uh, the interest of a lawful or bona fide occupant, you become a bona fide occupant on the land. So in practice, the only people protected by the law on my, on my land or whose interests are recognized are the two above categories. However, we should note that it's not uncommon to find that a myriad of land grabbers fight to be referred to as people with uh, protected interest in my land. And uh, uh, we should also note that a payment of soul evidenced by receipts of, of soul payment is all that is required to prove a tenancy by occupancy. And the tenancy, a tenant by occupant is either a lawful or bona fide occupant. So uh, having recognized that uh, it is important to belong to any of, of the above two uh, categories of people, uh, that is the lawful or bona fide occupant, the law provided for how a person can uh, transition from being uh, a non-recognized uh, occupant on the land to being a lawful or bona fide occupant on the land. So uh, the transition from the undocumented settler on my land to a bona fide occupant is a very important step in securing uh, the tenure on the land. The framers of the law provided for ways of achieving this status through purchase of lawful interest or negotiation. Section 30 of the, of the Land Act provides that a mediator shall aid the tenant and the landlord to come to an understanding. Uh, in verbatim, uh, section 30 provides that where a person has occupied and utilized or developed any land and challenged it by the registered owner of the land or an agent of the registered owner for less than 12 years and therefore does not qualify to be a bona fide bona fide occupant under section 29, that person shall take all reasonable steps to seek and identify the registered owner of the land for the purpose of undertaking negotiations with that owner concerning his or her occupation of the land. So they are supposed to negotiate and come to, understanding, to an understanding, which leads to a recognition by the registered owner that this person is, um, a, is a tenant bona fide on, uh, on, the, on that particular piece of land. Maybe I should add that uh, bona fide means that uh, the person is in good faith. Bona fide means good faith. Therefore, it means that a person is staying on the land in good faith. 
So as you see, the, the law provides that there is negotiation. If you can successfully negotiate, then you're, you're, you're living on the land in good faith. So where parties fail to agree, the law provides that uh, a mediator may, may help the parties to reach an agreement. And uh, where the mediator is involved and still the parties don't agree, then the parties can appeal to the land tribunal uh, of that particular district. And uh, there, there are some problems. Uh, in practice, the challenge with the implementation of this section is that uh, one, immediately the tenants get into occupation of the land, they cunningly start creating features that would uh, that they would use to claim that they have been on the land for longer than even 12 years. Many times they create fake tombs that they claim are for their ancestors who died in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 50s. And therefore the negotiation starts off from a wrong footing of accusations and counter accusations. Uh, the second uh, challenge is that uh, whereas the law provides for mediators whose services were supposed to be obtained at a sub county headquarters, these mediators were neither trained nor deployed at the centers, and therefore this service can be obtained through hiring very expensive mediators who actually in many cases help too little because of their limited knowledge of the challenges associated with the male land, especially of a particular title in a given area. Because each and every uh, piece of my land has its own challenges. Where I find that here there is an absentee landlord, which means a landlord who is not known or whose whereabouts are not, uh, are not ascertained. Or on, on another, you will find that a, a part of it has been used by a local authority to do something else. So, uh, the negotiators need to be need to have that local knowledge, and that's why it was uh, uh, envisioned by the by the framers of the law that they be based at the sub county, and therefore they would have their ears of the ground, which has not been done so far. The third is that the appeal from uh, an appointed mediator is supposed to lie with the district land tribunals, which are currently non-operational. Uh, therefore, the practicality of, of implementing uh, this provision of the law on ground is actually very, very cumbersome. Uh, then, uh, Section 31 of the Land Act provides for uh, expounds on the, on, the, on the tenancy by occupancy. As you have said, the tenancy by occupancy is a uh, means that a person either has the lawful or bona fide occupancy on the land. So it says that a tenant by occupancy on registered land shall enjoy security of occupancy on the land. A tenant by occupancy shall pay to the registered owner an annual nominal ground rent. Annual nominal ground rent shall be proposed by the board, the district land board, and approved by the minister of lands. Nominal ground rent shall mean reasonable ground rent, and in any case of a non-commercial nature, where the board fails to determine the annual nominal ground rent, it may be determined by the minister. And that uh, the tenant and the registered owner, if aggrieved by the decision of the board, may appeal against the decision to the land tribunal. And finally, that uh, the registered owner may apply to the land tribunal for an order terminating a tenancy for non-payment of nominal ground rent. Uh, in practice, uh, the security of the tenant largely depends on the payment of ground rent. However, there are uh, the following problems. One, there are no standardized receipts for acknowledgement of payment of ground rent. And two, the duty to determine ground rent was entrusted with the district land boards. Many have never submitted their proposals to the minister, and therefore the minister comes up with the one size fits them all for all districts in Uganda. And uh, the third challenge with this is that the law bars setting of uh, uh, ground rent that is at commercial nature 
that is of a commercial nature, whereas some of the affected land is in a commercial setting, which makes the landlords feel exploited. For example, you find that um, uh, a person is using the land and has a huge hardware shop on the land, but because it's, he is in a, in a town center, they, they set the, uh, the nominal bond rent at 20,000 uh, per year for any uh, for, for, for any acre of the land. Whether a person has uh, 20 acres, they pay that. And whether a person has 50 by 100, they pay that same amount. So the landlords many times feel uh, exploited by the, the tenants, which uh, kind of stirs the relationship in a bad way. Uh, and the fourth one is the absence of a specialized quasi-judicial body to handle dis disputes emanating from the setting and payment of the bond rent. As we have already noted, uh, uh, these uh, tribunals are non-existent. So there is nowhere to uh, appeal to in case uh, uh, you're not satisfied in any way by the issues of bond rent. Um, moving on to section 33, which provides for a certificate of customary ownership. Uh, so this provision of the law is to the effect that uh, uh, tenants on uh, my land shall be provided with uh, certificates of customary ownership. The idea behind was that uh, these would be used to recognize the different uh, uh, lawful and bona fide occupants on the land. But in practice, uh, these certificates are, are almost worthless because the banks don't recognize them. And in many cases, people who get certificates of, of, uh, of, of land want, of course, uh, to secure their tenure, but uh, additionally to uh, use the, those certificates uh, in business and uh, in transactions in, in order to better their lives. But these, for one reason or the other, they have not been recognized as, uh, as, uh, as any worthy documents. And therefore, the Vivanja holders are condemned to uh, borrowing money from only land, uh, for money lenders, and uh, very small circles. Um, uh, Section 34 of the Land Act provides the transactions with uh, provides uh, deals with the transactions with the tenancy by occupancy. Um, it is the effect that a tenant by occupancy may assign, sublate, or subdivide a tenancy with the consent of the landowner and that no transaction to which this section applies shall be valid and effective to pass any interest in land if it is undertaken without the consent of the landowner. The tenant by occupancy may appeal to the land tribunal in case of refusal to grant the consent or grant, uh, if, the, or if the, grant, the grant has been made with unfavorable conditions. And in practice, Actually, most of the transactions on Milo land happen without this consent for the reason that the tenants and even squatters are for one reason or the other, more empowered than the land owners. The Milo landlords have little or no say up and until the time when the tenant opts to carve out his land and register it. So the only time that the, the landlord can have an upper hand in, a, in this arrangement is when the lawful or bona fide occupant wishes to register the land. And, and therefore they need registration documents like uh, uh, mutation and transfer forms signed by the landlord. That is where, that is the only time in my experience when the landlord has some power and leverage over the, uh, the, the tenancy by occupancy. And uh, section 35 uh, provides for options uh, to purchase. And it's the effect that uh, where the landlord desires to sell their reversionary interest in land, or the tenant wishes to transact in their occupancy interest, they shall give each other the first option. It mean, this means that if you have a chivanja on uh, someone's land, you don't sell before consulting them. And if they want to sell their reversionary interest as the uh, registered proprietors, they also have to inform you and will give you an offer 
which you can accept or which you can refuse, and therefore they can move on to the next person. So it is an offense for the tenant to purport to assign the tenancy by occupants without giving the first option of taking the assignment of the tenancy to the owner of the land. A change of ownership of my land by sale or succession shall not jeopardize the existing occupancy interests. So in, in practice, the implementation of this provision remains cumbersome for the non-existence of district land tribunals to enforce in case of non-compliance. So we, it goes back to the, the challenges that, you, that we are facing. So section 36, which is one of the uh, most important sections in, uh, in, uh, in this law, in my opinion, is, the, is in regards to land sharing. And it provides that uh, the landowner and the tenant by occupancy may agree to subdivide the land and own exclusively the agreed portions or become joint or tenants in common. The registrar may either make the appropriate entries on the certificate or title of the land or issue new certificates of, of title to the parties. In practice, uh, the most successful way of dealing with uh, the multiple ownership interests on my land that does not disadvantage any of the parties to a large extent has been found to be uh, the land sharing. As usually, neither the landlord nor the tenant has the money required for a buyout. Uh, it is this uh, land sharing is based on negotiation and no percentages are cast in stone. So it is, uh, it is a negotiation between the parties. And, uh, but however, uh, the, the six, the 40 to tenant and landowner respectively uh, has been found most appropriate in the vast number of cases. So usually you find that where uh, a, a, a tenant has 10 acres on, a, on someone's land, when they are implementing uh, this provision, uh, section 36, they tend to share the land in uh, uh, 60, 40, where the, where the tenant gets 60% of the land and, uh, and the landowner gets 40% of the land. However, the landowner has to meet the, ex the expenses of uh, producing a land title and handing it over uh, to, the, to the tenant for transfer. So as I conclude my uh, presentation, I have a few observations. Uh, one is that on top of the complex overlapping land rights, the land pressure, the land pressure in mild areas for all the land use categories has shot through the roof. Be it residential and commercial in the cities, municipalities and towns, or industrial in industrial zones like Namave and Mbalala, to agriculture in rural Uganda, my land is experiencing unprecedented pressures, which have shot up the value, sometimes astronomically and without scientific backing of the commensurate economic activity in an area. And two is that uh, the change from the pre-1900 conception of the value of land has been very drastic. And many times land is measured in form of its smallest unit, a decimal, and value attached to that. This has caused all the formerly dormant landlords, some of whom were previously absent, uh, this has caused uh, all the, for, the formerly dormant landlords, some of whom were previously absent, to develop immense interest in turning the otherwise worthless titles into a fortune. The third observation is that the land, the land dealers buy out interests of these usually disgruntled registered male owners cheaply because of their diminished confidence in ever getting anything from the land. The land, the land buyers then attempt to deal with the lawful and bona fide occupants and squatters on the land through outright illegal evictions facilitated by security agencies, which is very, very unfortunate. And uh, my first 
preservation is that uh, because of its closeness to the capital city, willingness of my landowners to transact in it, which is different from, um, for example, customary, because you can look for customary land and fail to get it. And even when you get it, then you, 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 the customs cannot allow you to own that land. And uh, the ease of buying my land and its versatility in land use, it is one of the most popular holdings in Uganda with registered titles numbering over 1 million and uh, several million non-documented, non-registered interests on, on the land. With all the known problems of my land, as discussed above, many prospective land buyers would prefer to buy my land to any other, uh, to any other tenure in my experience. So in conclusion, the land law regime is not the problem per se, but the failure of government to operationalize the agencies concerned with land administration. The continued absence of land tribunal, the specialized quasi-judicial body that was charged with solving a lot of matters on the land, the undermining by security agencies of court judgments and court orders, the use of security agencies to terrorize tenants on the land, and the failure of court to dispose of cases, land cases in a timely manner has brought the otherwise workable tenure in disrepute and putting some sections of uh, our society to seek the abolition of my land. Therefore, the state of my land in Uganda is a state of uncertainty waiting for whatever uh, comes. So we await a cabinet, a cabinet decision on the same in order to guide on the way forward and the discussions on my land as we move forward. I thank you so much. Thank you very much, very, very much, RSU, Edisa Kabisa. We are very grateful for the insightful information you have given to us. I think right now, whoever has been listening is almost becoming an expert, and they're always becoming an expert at my own land. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are really grateful for your time and the lots of information that you have given to us. Uh, right now, we shall take on a few questions before we proceed. And the first one shall be, in case my land is abolished, what effect would this have on the surveying and valuation professions? I think I'll read all of them out at once and then you answer accordingly. So the second one is, what next for landlords and tenants occupying land under this tenor in case my land tenor is scrapped as proposed? Then why are land problems most, most be encountered in the central region? And lastly, how can the issue of absentee landlords under the tenure be addressed? So RSC Edisa, before you answer the question, I also have a question of my own. Uh, just in case, let's say a mediator fails to solve the issue, like at that stage when they bring in a mediator, let's say they find him, in, they find the mediator not being impartial and they would like to proceed further. Do they necessarily have to go to the Luchiko of Uganda or you can proceed to higher courts? Yeah, thank you so much. We await the response. Thank you so much. Uh, let me start with the, the last one. Uh, the, the law does not provide in any way uh, an appeal to the Wichiko of Uganda. Uh, that was a position uh, pre-1995 uh, 
Okay, let me let me not go there because I, I, I will expand the discussion too much. But uh, the appeal process for uh, for on my land is that uh, you go to the district land tribunals. And now, given that the district land tribunals are not in existence as of now, you have to go to the, the courts of law. You have to go to the courts of law. So you have to look at what they call. Um, the geographical, uh, the geographical uh, jurisdiction and the, and the pecuniary jurisdiction. If the land is uh, not more than 20 million worth, you go to the magistrate's court. If it is uh, more than 50 million, you go to the, to the high court of Uganda. Remember the land tribunal is not there. So now from your appointed mediator, you have to go straight to the, uh, to the court. Uh, the second question is, in case my land is abolished, what effect will it have on the surveying and um, valuation professions? Uh, honestly speaking, the, the proposal by government is uh, to abolish my land and in its place, I should say the proposal by the current state minister for lands because uh, a cabinet a, a government proposal is communicated through a cabinet uh, position which has not yet been done but the proposal by the current state minister for lands uh, honorable sam mayanja is that uh, uh, all those uh, bivanja holders on my land be allowed to create uh, uh, to to have to have uh, to to have their titles in their own right without reference to the uh, male owners or without seeking uh, uh, the sending of papers, the, the, the crucial papers, like imitation form and the transfer forms from the uh, registered land owners, from the registered male owners. Uh, in my opinion, I think we would have a boom uh, in the works. However, uh, I, I should uh, I should warn that uh, it seems that uh, it is illegal and therefore unenforceable. But if it ever happened, I think we'll have a boom because there, there are so many um, unknown, unknown male, male owners. And therefore, if, uh, if that, uh, that route to the male owner is cut short, maybe there would be a lot of business uh, creating uh, fresh titles from, on my land, fresh visible titles on my land and the like. But I, as I said, it seems very unconstitutional. And therefore, it is something that is going to be very hard to pull through. And the next question is, what next for landlords and tenants occupying land under this tenure in case my land tenure is proposed. How uh, they, they be uh, scrapped with it is done, parliament or the uh, amendment of the existing uh, legal regime, then the, the landlords have uh, the option of, of going into court uh, to seek uh, the question of uh, that decision. So the years they have the courts to go to. The third one was most encountered in the central region. I alluded to that in my presentation. Uh, uh, it's mostly because the land is very close to the city where uh, most of the business uh, happens. And the land is, uh, it's very easy to transact in my land. So the transactions are so many and my land allows each and every Ugandan to, 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 to own an interest in my land as it is not tied to a particular culture, a particular tribe, anyone can buy. So the volumes are so, the user, the, the use for which you can put the land is so various. And therefore, uh, uh, there is a lot of interest uh, that is being shown by the uh, 
by the community on uh, on acquiring my land and where there is uh, and that in itself has caused the, the conflicts because they know if you get a piece of my land you have a fortune and uh, the last question is how can the issue of absentee landlords under this tenure be addressed uh, i think governments can find a way of tracing who the descendants of those absentee landlords are and um, when i spoke to the senior land management office of the ministry he told me that they are undergoing uh, the process of uh, identifying all these people and uh, trying to know who they are and uh, talk to them uh, especially in, in places like Chibale, and negotiate with them to see whether they can buy out their interests so yes the the, the, the government has the ability to find the descendants of these absentee landlords and solve the Maryland impasse. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Donald. Donald, please. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, RSU Edrisa, for the insightful presentation. I'm um, seeking clarity on the, on, the, on the sharing. Is it uh, 60 to the landlord and 40 to Vivanga owners? Uh, the general rule is that uh, that sharing is not cast in stone. It is uh, out of uh, uh, negotiations between the two parties, the, the, the tenant by occupancy and the landowner. And therefore, the, you can agree that uh, in this case, it is going to be 50-50, or you can agree that it's going to be 45-55, Whatever you agree upon is what is implemented by the registrar, by the surveyor, and ultimately by the registrar. So I gave the 6040 as, uh, in my experience, what has worked most for me in solving some of these challenges. Uh, but uh, any, any percentage can do for as long as uh, the two parties are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. We appreciate we appreciate your time and the information you passed on and to us. We as the survey students, we are very, very, very grateful. So if there's no other question, I think we should proceed with the next speaker. Yes, it is okay. You're occupying it. I said no. It's okay. You, if it is to process titles, you make Where it. Where are they going to process it from? Because it is in our title. No. Uh, as Alia introduced, we're going to be having our second speaker called RSU Chizito Bashe Juma. He's very, very many things. His CV is just so uh, do, you, do you guys hear me? Is anyone hearing me? Yes we, can, yes, we can hear you. So our next keynote speaker is Aris. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. And I had introduced him earlier, but as you see, he's really big. He's so many things. He's an RSU, he's a fellow, he's the head of department, he's a district staff, staff surveyor at Nakaseke, he's the acting district staff surveyor, he's a personal attorney to the Kabaka, that's really amazing. He has an experience of 18 years and he's the co-director of the Power Survey Consult. Yes, Aris, you visit over here. We are very pleased to have you and for sparing your time. Uh, the platform is all yours, sir.
Hello. I'm loud. Am I on? I, uh, someone has sent me a message that I need to unmute. I'm hoping that uh, you can already hear my voice. Am I loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, what lies ahead of Uganda's land tenure system, given some of the suggestions to abolish Milo land? The desire to amend, stroke, abolish the Milo land and perhaps other land tenure systems stems from what we refer to as the Uganda National Land Policy Implementation Action Plan. For those of you who can follow my presentation, yeah, there is what we call the Uganda National Land Policy Implementation Action Plan 2015 16. Uh, to 2018-19. This plan controversially makes a number of proposals, including some constitutional amendments. The following are some of the amendments that that plan proposes. In fact, it doesn't just stop at proposing, but it contemplates, proposes, and even refers them to the, appro to the appropriate processes for implementation. The first is what we call the radical title. Uh, the framers of this policy plan intend to amend Article 237. Uh, those of you who are familiar with this article, it says that all land belongs to citizens of Uganda. <coughs> Excuse me. So this amendment aims at shifting this power from the citizens of Uganda and then conferring it to the state to exercise it on behalf of the people. So where we have a statement that reads, land belongs to the citizens of Uganda, now that will change. It will belong to the state or to the government of Uganda. And it will be up to the government to distribute, to allocate, to, to do all sorts of things. Yes. So this proposal is contained in that implementation plan and um, therefore uh, the issue of abolishing my land seems to appear like just a process it is part of the process to the end result the end result is to amend and empower the state to the radical title of the land in uganda the second controversial recommendation and uh, something they have taken for implementation is the formation of a land agency uh, that should guarantee titles in Uganda and then hold reversionary interest over public land and other lands as necessary. What that means, instead of having MZOs, Ministry of Lands, ETC, ETC, you'll have a land agency like UNRWA or something like that. But such agency, will be responsible for all the functions as performed by uh, the current district land boards, by the current land offices, you know, all embodied in one, that agency. And then it will equally have reversional interest. Now, by the state taking over power, it means we will be offered leases uh, to this land or, um, or as they may choose to call it, either freeholds or leases, but the reversional interest will remain in this agency. The third amendment for the constitution is, is, is again in Article 237 of the constitution, which aims to limit the power of compulsory acquisition to the central government. And then the fourth is taxation of idle land. Um, and, and then for purposes of today's discussion, I will concentrate on only the first constitutional reform proposed that is empowering the state to exercise the radical title of land. I've given the four others for you to see why I call them controversial. 
because we are all familiar with the process that formed um, the national land use policy. It was a very consultative process, but this implementation plan doesn't seem to have taken a similar route. So you can see a number of other proposals. And I've, I've gone through this as well to help you know, because there have been suggestions that for any amendment uh, of the land tenure systems, the amendment would be unconstitutional. So, so there would be need to, to, um, to, to amend, work through the constitution to, to, to amend the articles of the constitution such that it becomes a constitutional matter. Otherwise, if they don't amend and simply work on laws, that law would be unconstitutional, it would be taken to court and the court would render it unconstitutional. Remember the law says any law that is below uh, the, uh, the, uh, the constitution is governed by the constitution. The constitution is the supreme law of the land. So anything you do and is in contravention of the constitution can and is always declared unconstitutional and, and, and thrown away. So. The architects of these reforms know that very well, and they have therefore proposed amendments of the constitution, such that the constitution will, starting from Article 237, will change and, 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 and transfer the rights of ownership of land from you, the citizens, to the state, and, and plus the other amendments I have shown. These are uh, public documents you can read if you are very interested. They, you can read the national land policy and then that implementation plan, the action plan to the implementation of the policy. So the question would be, are there really any justifications against my land tenure? Should we really labor to amend the constitution and abolish it? Um, we must remember, and I must emphasize here, that although no formal paper, government has not written a paper, there is no cabinet paper yet, and my colleague Kabiswa has just said that, we were waiting for government's guidance and direction. Although there is no formal paper by government explaining the rationale and, uh, of, of such reforms, especially the abolition of Milo land, uh, the following reasons have been taunted by government responsible ministers. We have the junior state minister uh, for lands, Honorable Mayanja, and others who have been quoted in the press and various sections of the media. So we, we are right to have this discussion and we are right even to see if there is any justification for the abolishment of this Milo land. Um, the most quoted reason is the historical complexes and land tenure relations or what has now famously been called the historical injustices. The advent of colonialism formalized individual ownership of land to the disposition or loss by some individuals or even communities. Then, colleague Kabiso has just gone through the 19 agreement and, 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 and showed how um, the land was shared and how uh, some other sections of the society were defranchised. You, you, you can see some members of society like the Bataka, uh, some members of society, the, the common man, um, the Bakopi, if you choose to call them that, were left with no rights over ownership on land. So yes, such complexities, I call them complex because uh, the new land rights were superimposed to the existing indigenous land rights or systems, thereby creating multiple and often conflicting tenure rights and interests. So it is a fact that there lies multiple and often conflicting tenure rights and interests on Milo land. Does it form justification? That's another issue, but at least we know that is a reason and has been rightly quoted. The second is the land disputes and conflict. It is true that land disputes and conflicts have become part of the definition of contemporary Uganda. And Milo land complexes, like I've shown above, have been blamed for the escalating land conflicts and evictions in the central region. Of course, my colleague Kabiso again has just given a number of reasons why 
the majority of these conflicts are in the central region, not necessarily because of the multiple and conflict land tenure rights, uh, but to so many other reasons, the economic value, uh, the ease with which people can acquire land, etc, etc. So, do the justifications given above really give or provide a good rationale? Uh, before you labor to uh, understand or take sides on that, I, I, I should inform you that the national land use policy uh, introduces a number of options to manage the injustice just described above. Yes, it is true that the introduction of formal land rights by the colonialists created great injustice to some sections of the community, as the allotment was largely negotiated, and it is clear that the biggest beneficiaries were those represented in the negotiations. However, the majority of the current registered minor owners are not the beneficiaries of that donation done in 1900 and may have acquired the land through legitimate trade. So the national land policy in its wisdom uh, introduces a number of options to manage that injustice. The first is land sharing between the registered owner and the tenant. Uh, colleague Kabiso has just mentioned uh, what has happened in practice. Various ratios are mooted, depends on the power to negotiate. So various percentages are used, 60, 40, 50, 50, 30, 70, 35, 65, anything, as long as uh, there is consensus. Um, the second is payment of nominal ground rent. The policy envisaged a situation where it would be difficult to share, where the status quo had to be, to be maintained, and therefore uh, made it mandatory for the people in position uh, the lawful and bona fide occupant to pay nominal ground rent initially being 1000 but even after the amendments uh, the highest now for anybody with the chivanja in in a city like kampala is 50000 as 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 declared by the minister of lands so you can imagine if somebody has a chivanja in kampala or nakasero street or anywhere the maximum they can pay is 50000 the reason being, this is nominal, it is not commercial, it is not ground rent uh, levied on commercial terms, but payment, that is nominal. The third is the land fund, um, operationalized by the Ministry of Land, and this fund was uh, supposed to be used to buy land for redistribution to the bona fide and lawful occupants, buy land from the absentee landlords, and then re redistribute to the bona fide and lawful occupants. So the fund would be available for access to both the landlords and, and the tenants. For the tenants who seek to buy themselves, yeah, if I choose to use that phrase, buy themselves, but referring to buy their Milo interest and become registered proprietors, they would have an opportunity to, to apply for the fund to buy such interest or the landlords themselves would freely give up the land in exchange for that compensation and leave the land for government to redistribute to the bona fide and lawful occupants. Then we have another option of leasing. Uh, it happens where the registered owner leases land to the sitting tenant for an agreed period, 99 years being the maximum and for the payment of some consideration being premium and annual ground rate. This model of leasing is, uh, is successfully being executed by Buganda Land Board. For your information, Buganda Land Board manages Milo land, but a different kind of Milo, official Milo land. It manages Milo land and we have bona fide and lawful occupants on such land. So Buganda Land Board uses this model uh, referred to here in the policy leasing. Of course, something I've not retained is, is, is buyout. I've just mentioned it in my words, but I haven't written somewhere. Yes, finally, yeah, it is written at the end, buyout by either party. 
So the, uh, the tenants can, can choose to buy themselves out or the landlords can choose to compensate the tenants and each party is left with encumbrance free land. Now we need to investigate whether those options given above have been undertaken, have they been supported by government? And if so, how effective have the options been, especially in regard to the rationale, the justification given? Um, we remember the two justifications, the historical injustices as they are called, and then the land disputes and conflict on Milo land. Um, if we choose to investigate uh, we must note that Milo land tenure represents about 10% of land under this tenure. The bulk of the tenure regime in Uganda is customary. It, it, it represents about 85% of land in Uganda being held under a single tenure. Customary tenure represents 85%. So as to if the solution to 10% of tenure underlines the solution to Uganda's issue on land disputes and conflict, that remains to be seen. It's difficult to envisage that solutions to 10% can offer um, success, can offer solutions to disputes and conflict across even areas that are not under my land tenure. But if that is the case, can we look at other solutions that have been advanced again by the national land use policy and other commentators in trying to offer solutions to land disputes and conflicts. Because um, in his conclusion, RSU Kabiso said that legislation really shouldn't be the problem. The problem should not be in the existence of uh, the legal regime, the existence of the minor tenure. What could then be some of the solutions we can use to sort the problem being fronted as a reason for disputes and conflicts in the in central Uganda. The first is encouraging the ADR, the alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. And um, the policy recommends administrative mediation committees at lower levels, at especially at districts and even up to parishes, such that the landlords and tenants willing to share land can, can be guided through this ADR, through these mediation committees on how best they can achieve their objectives. Again, um, this ADR can offer guidelines on how successful mediation and adjudication should happen. That is number one, and we feel just as provided by the National Land Policy, and it is my conviction too, that ADR can offer a very good alternative to curbing down the level of disputes and conflicts in the country. The second is the reality and appearance of the current judicial system. I'm calling it a reality and appearance because in law, just like Idris, I will tell you, um it's not enough to have justice to be done it must be seen to be done yeah when people are aggrieved and go to court they should see through the system that the system is transparent that it is fair and just so even if you offer a decision that is just and fair but which was not witnessed some sections of the people will feel that it's not fair so it is it is necessary that the judicial system offers avenues that appear to be just, not just the, the decisions, but even the whole process. So that's what I call the reality and appearance. The reality is what? What is happening? Is the judicial system fair? The, the, the presence of a backlog, the fact that we have so many cases that take 10 years, nine years, 12 years to be, um, uh, for the judges to make a decision shows that justice is being delayed and justice delayed is justice denied um we all know what happens in court if you've had a land matter there other than the delay there's so much that can be put to play that in most cases 
uh, people don't walk away with, 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 with just decisions. And then there is the matter of enforcement of decisions that are made. Uh, that is something that should be targeted. Yes, you can get an order and then someone can, can choose to refuse because um, of their ability, or because of their connections, because of so many other reasons. So we, uh, other than working out on the judicial system, we should be able to see the enforcement of decisions that are made by the judicial system. Uh, the third is the institution, institutions in charge of enforcement of law and order, such as the police, the land protection uh, agencies, RDCs, and all other players uh, involved in investigation of land matters. Often, these people are grossly incapacitated. They don't have in their employment surveyors, they don't have lawyers, they don't have um, uh, people who can talk to people sociologists. So they end up just using emotions at times or even being corrupted to investigate these land matters. So it is important that these institutions um, are built up, their capacity is, a, a, is reinforced um, and, and that they have the ability to work against um, members of the security agencies that often override their orders. There's one thing, these people not being able to do their job, but it's also another for their decisions to be undermined by people or sections of people who have power and influence in society. The third is corruption at all stages, land offices, judiciary, police, virtually everywhere, everyone involved in the land business is, 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 is I, I can safely say is corrupt. So this undermines and further fuels the land conflicts on the middle land and in the central region. Um, then finally, the resource inadequacy. Many of these offices, MZOs, land offices are not adequately facilitated. They lack even simple logistics, things like computers, even the human resource, surely. Some of these offices have one person as the district surveyor, one person as the EMSO SS. When the volumes handled by far outweigh the ability, when we should have 10 EMSO senior staff surveyors, when we should have five district staff surveyors, we end up having one. We end up having one computer for each person. We end up having some people unable to access um, this equipment. We have situations, it is not unheard of to go to the land office and it lacks printing cartridge, you know? We have land offices that would even spend a month without generators, without power, you know? So um, that itself is, is not okay because when people go searching for, for information at these land offices and the offices are not able because of those underlying inadequacies, we are one way or another fueling the land conflicts uh, and disputes in the region. So what lies ahead? What is the future of land, Uganda's land tenure in Uganda? One, government will continue to push for the constitutional amendments. I just mentioned that the discussion has just come to light uh, during the appointment of the junior minister for land. But I've also shown you that this is already part of the action plan. I've, I've, I've mentioned to you the Uganda National Land Policy Implementation Action Plan that has been in place from 2015 to date. So it shows you how committed government is to work out constitutional amendments to empower the, with, the over, with the overall goal being the state exercising the radical title of land in trust for the benefit of the citizens of Uganda, among others. This is the position held by government and therefore the abolition of mineral land or not will not stop the government's pursuit of this goal. What do I see in the near future? Um, I can see 
that because of political reasons, my land may not be abolished, but uh, the tenants of this tenure may be diluted so much to the extent that it is irrelevant to the registered proprietor. Um, so the second is the state will, however, continue to promote for individual property rights, because as we are all aware, this promotes economic development in the country. However, such property rights will, in my view, have decreased bundles within them. I think we shall see uh, government trying to disengage or disentangle the multiple and conflict tenure rates in any tenure system. How, if effective it will be, we remain to see uh, in the near future. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to address and share my, what I can call my knowledge on my land that has been earned in my 17 years of practice. I feel proud being of this webinar, having myself being a member of MAS. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so, so much, Aisle Dasher. We are very enlightened. We thank you for this insightful session you've taken us through about the current state of my land. Yeah, we as students have some questions for you that we'd like you to enlighten us on. Yeah, if any of the participants has a question, please feel free. Aris Yubashir is ready to answer. Yeah, if any of the participants has a question, if you have a question, feel free. The platform is used to ask. Uh, I think let me go first. Yeah. I see, but if I have a question that I would like some enlightenment on. Like if at all there are any prospects of abolition, yeah, we, we know it takes time and it goes through channels, but if at all there are any prospects of abolishing the my land, I would like to inquire like who 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 is in charge of making the final say? Is this the president? Is it the, the Baganda? Who is in charge of making like the final decision about that? Yes, thank you very much. Maybe I can wait for all the questions and I can take them at a go. I think people have understood so much that they barely have any questions. So I think in the meantime, you can be taking up that one. Thank you very much. I can see Lugamba Gerard with his hand up. I don't know if he has a question. Yes, I have. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, RSU, for the wonderful presentation. I have a question about the agreement between the tenant and the landlord. Yeah, section 36 provides that there should be the agreement on subdivision, maybe if the tenant wants to take a part and the, the landlord, as Alice Yukabiswa said at first. Uh, here comes a situation. What if the tenant is not willing to take a certain percentage for now, maybe when he still wants to 
be a tenant not to have full ownership for the meantime. Is it, does the landlord has the right to forcefully divide the land? Because usually it happens in villages. Is there a law that can protect the tenant in the case he's not willing to divide the land? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Jared. And again, um, my moderator, thank you. I'll start with the first question. Um, abolishing my land, the prospects, if it were to be done, who has the final say? Uh, the legal process is clear. Uh, the consultations can be done like they are being now, but the process um, usually starts with the cabinet. Cabinet sits and makes a position. Then the minister responsible takes that cabinet position to parliament. Because what is going to be done is called an amendment of the constitution. So they take that position to parliament to seeking to amend a particular article. In this case, it will be 237 uh, of the constitution. And then, of course, you know what happens in parliament, it is debated, and finally, uh, they may vote a yes and nays. So if the yes, those in favor of the pro proposals, or those in favor of the amendments outweigh those who are not, then that becomes uh, the position of parliament. So then that is drafted and then taken into, uh, taken as, um, as a bill for consent to the president. Now the president may, may, may sign on it and as a result it becomes law or may um, offer proposals for particular parts of, of that bill to be changed and bring it back to parliament or may refuse to sign it altogether. Again, the process is clear. If the president refuses, what happens? If he says yes, what happens? If he says there are changes. If there are changes, he proposes they are brought back to the parliament and then amended and taken back to the president for final signing. But yes, who has the final say? The president has the final say on this process. Um, the second issue from Gerard, what happens where the, uh, the tenant is not willing to share? Yes, there's nothing under law that can be used to force the tenant. All these other things are optional. Sharing is optional. The only thing that is not optional is payment of nominal ground rent of a soul. And that is the only reason uh, a tenant can lose their chivanya. Otherwise, sharing, buying, leasing, all that depends on the two people, the landlord or the registered owner and the tenant being in agreement. Less than that, someone cannot be forced. But we just mentioned earlier the problems in the industry. People are um, often um, bribe the judicial system, people bribe the agencies, the RDCs and police. So this other tenant may fail to get justice simply because the system has been bribed. The system has been corrupted. Uh, but it is clear uh, they cannot be forced. If they don't want to participate, then there's nothing they can, uh, that can be done to force them. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, hello. I have a question. Um, can you hear me? RSU? Yes, Shafiq, we can hear you. I have a question. Now, um, you talked about the avenues government would ideally take on to separate the interests of uh, Chivanja and uh, landlords. In your opinion, uh, what are those tools that are disposable to the government. And in my understanding, Mailoland being a unique tenure in the whole world, 
is there any way you can benchmark the best practices that would ideally leave the landlord and the Chibanja holder both in harmony, yet government at the same time is pushing its agenda? Uh, thank you, Shafiq. Uh, you can see Fred as well has a question. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Kabiswa and Mr. Kizito. I've really learned a lot. I was looking at the historical part of it, and I remember uh, President Amin abolished, abolished uh, the mainland during his tenure as a president. Uh, we see a new, a new president coming in, and we go back to the system. Uh, I'm looking at a situation that if I become the president tomorrow, I will also bring in my own ideas. Don't you think it's time for us to have a system which is independent of the presidential heads, a system which can be like looked at or developed, which can stand, which stand the test of time? Can't we have a system which can run 200, 200 years without being disturbed? I see as if we are going to run forth uh, and back. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. There is Mr. Rugambwa. Um, good, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, um, is the abolition of Milo land going to have a very big impact on the price of land, the current price of land in Uganda? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rugambo. I can see Kamu. Kamu has his hand up. Kamu uh, has a question. Hello. Uh, yep. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Uh, mine is to thank you, Arisu Kizito Bashil and uh, Arisu Kabiswa Ibrisa for the great insights you've shared with us. Uh, surely the Mayolo land question is uh, a hot cake all over. Wherever we go, as others always ask, uh, what is your take on the Milo land, uh, Milo land uh, question? Uh, away, from, away from that, uh, the, share, the, the historical perspective that we got from uh, RSU Kabiswa and uh, partly RSU Chizicho, it, 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 it appears the Milo land question stems from the 1900 agreement. And, uh, we, we all agree that there are injustices that were served onto the sitting uh, owners of the land at that time. Should we conclude that perhaps this problem that is recalling every other regime, could it be a curse from our grandfathers? Like, it, it's never been solved. Like, we've seen people waving pangas here and there. Uh, the, the attempt to produce, to, to, grant private mile titles, uh, private mile titles to uh, the, the, the landlords, it was as if it was trying to solve the problem, but still, it, it appears it's still so complex. So could uh, one be right to uh, deduce that perhaps it's uh, the curses that we inherited from our grandfathers? Thank you. Thank you, Kamu, uh, for the interesting question. Um, I don't know if Jared still has his hand up or it, um, it just remains. But I'll proceed to make my response. Shafiq started off by um, saying uh, that Milo land is unique. Yes, that is true. It is unique to Uganda. And therefore, do we have areas we can benchmark? We actually don't need to benchmark outside Uganda. We have seen places or systems or places where 
um, this relationship between tenants and landlords is, is moving on very, very well. I just mentioned earlier the relationship between Kabaka and the, the people, the tenants on my land, which is governed partly by leasing and partly by paying usul. But I believe that the land, national land use policy offers useful ways of how these people, uh, both of them can exist on the land. Um, one is sharing. That I don't need to over explain. It, uh, we've already said enough of it. Two, share, I mean, paying of nominal ground rent. Um, as long as tenants just keep paying that nominal ground rent, I think the status quo can be maintained. But there's something even worth considering. That is the land fund. Government has the ability. Because you see, what is the problem between tenants and the registered owners? It is about deriving benefit from the land. The, the landlord cannot benefit from the land because even if he has a title, they cannot access their land. So the land has no value. In the same scenario, the sitting person is in possession of the land. They can use the land. But where they choose to go to the bank or to use their land as an asset, they lack a title and therefore the land is useless in that regard. So both of them have, have that problem, that mutual problem, benefit from the land. And that can be sorted by using the land fund. How? The landlords can be compensated for their interest as registered owners. So that means they can, they get a benefit from their land. They can use that money and buy it free of vacant land elsewhere. Then, um, if, that, if, if the land fund offers money to compensate the landlords, it means then uh, the Ibanja people automatically become the landowners. They become the Chibang they graduate from Chibanja to registered proprietors. So the land fund can effectively offer uh, a very good solution to this relationship. But even in the absence of the fund, we still have those two um, avenues. I mentioned sharing, I mentioned leasing, um, I mentioned the nominal ground rent uh, option. So we don't have to benchmark. We have landlords in Mitiana, in Movende, in Cassandra districts through a program pioneered by GIZ, facilitated by the European Union and uh, in partnership with the government of Uganda through the Ministry of Lands. And I will tell you, they have done tremendous work in those three districts uh, in line with these proposals. Uh, and it's interesting. The, uh, people are sharing land and uh, it, it has helped a lot in, answer, in settling some of these issues. Uh, second question by Fred, why do we have a system that can't stand the test of time? The 1975 decree, we only lived until 1998 when we had the Land Act and the Constitution in 1995. So we keep seeing new changes. Yes, Fred, the strength it lies with the Constitution. The moment we allow to have a Constitution that is easy to amend, then that is where the problem is. In having a Constitution, people must discuss and agree to the fairest or best case scenario for any article in the constitution. And therefore agree not to amend with ease um, uh, the issues. A very good constitution is difficult to amend. A constitution that is not very good always calls for amendment. So they stem from the articles themselves of the constitution to the laws themselves that can become obsolete or that get rulings from court to particular sections of the law that keep changing. So the, the answer Fred, is really it lies in the strength of the constitution. Yes, you're right, a new leader can come and change uh, these, uh, 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 the laws we are making now. That is very true, but a very good constitution of law and respect of the rule of law. Um, if our leaders, can respect the law, if our leaders can stop being greedy and selfish and just um, maintain the positions of the law without caring to amend them to benefit them as individuals, then we can see 
laws that live for a longer time. And the third uh, is if of abolition of myro land, what it has on the price of land. Price of land is dictated by, among other issues, the use. Even if you are going to pay for land anywhere, the use dictates uh, uh, the price of the land, what use the land can be used for, uh, and, and then is it registered or not. So if my land is abolished, um, and, and the question will be, what will it be replaced with? Uh, if the state may offer leases, the state may offer freehold. And like you already know, my land is, is unique to, to Uganda. So, so many areas in the world that are governed by um, uh, land belonging to the state. So yes, it will remain pricey, uh, even when it is in the hands of government, for as long as the uses are competitive. Land values increase as the competition for the use increases. That is why in the CBD, you can use space for so many uses, for shops, for offices, for residential. That means the users are very many competing against that piece of land, and that's why the prices keep going high. In our rural areas, the price of land is not as high. Why? Because probably the single most use is agriculture. So for as long as the uses are not in competition, then the values keep low, regardless of the tenure. So uh, uh, that is what I see. Even when it is abolished, the prices will not go down per se. Um, is it a curse? The 19 agreement to the elders do us uh, a problem. Are we living uh, in an era of, 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 of evil that this curse is living over us? Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't want to call, I wouldn't want to choose to call it a curse. But certainly, yes, um, the, the history suggests that um, our parents, our ancestors created a problem that we are, we are trying to sort at the moment. But perhaps maybe we should have a, a, a comprehensive look at the issues beyond the tenure, beyond the problems we are having. How about the unemployment rate? How about the level of poverty? How about the economy? Are people's wealth, is people's welfare okay? Do people have the money and the ability to have a good life? I can tell you, people living elsewhere in the world don't even have to own land. They don't have to, but their sense of living, their standards of living are very okay. So I think we ought to look at this in a bigger way. The unemployment levels, if people have money, if people are working and are employed and can rent, I know, for, for instance, so many rich men outside Uganda, in, in Europe and America, who are still renting even at the age of 50, even at the age of 60, because why do they want to own a house? What for? But in Uganda, uh, land offers a guarantee of some security of some kind, reflecting our levels of, of, of affluence. And that's where the problem is. If, if we can change the state of economy, if people can get to be employed, if people can create employment, if people's standards of living improve, then I'm sure some of the problems will cease to be and people will concentrate on other areas. We should be having uh, issues to do with technology because we're in a, in a digital era, but unfortunately, as you all know, we are still embodied in, in trivial issues of land. We have, we have offered land ownership to be a bigger reason other than use. And that's the problem. Emphasis should be on use and access to land than even ownership. But that is where we are. It was a problem created. Incidentally, before the advent of the colonial, colonials, as clearly pointed out in our history, um, this emphasis, this individualization of land was not there. Uh, thank you so uh, much, RSU Bashu. We appreciate your time and the knowledge you have provided to us. Let me call upon Emmanuel Akandana who to give us a vote of thanks. Hello, oh, yes, uh, generous, can you hear me?
Yes, can you hear me? Hello, can you, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Emma, no, we can't hear you. So, Thank you so much. I need to unmute and switch. Just give me, give me a few seconds. Let me read, let me. You can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but shall we know you I was thinking. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Is it, uh, let me know, is it very clear, Arnold? Yes, yes, no, it's clear. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I want to take uh, this uh, moment of time to thank the entire mass team, that's uh, Donald and the entire team, the mass cabinet that uh, you know took the initiative to organize this webinar. I personally have been have been pondering on the same issue, and I think it was a. Uh, I think you know really the. Sorry about that. I think really the panelists, if you were part of the team, the panelists really did a great job to analyze, to take us through from the genesis, from everything since 1900 to the present, to where we are. And I want to thank you so much. That's uh, the speakers. That was Mr. Bashir Chizito and then uh, Idrissa Kaviswa. Thank you so much for taking your time, part of your time to to introduce to us the issue at hand. And as part of a student at Macquarie University, as a Zuso valuer, I've also learned a lot. And I hope that uh, even my colleagues who are part of this of this webinar gained enough sufficient information to learn about the issue at hand concerning my land. Thank you so much. And uh, and that's, that's uh, I mean, God bless you in all you're doing. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Uh, I, I don't really know if you guys have heard Emmanuel speak, but Emmanuel, your voice was so low, we couldn't. We could Emmanuel, your voice was so. If you could please speak in case, in case you are not able to hear me, let me just use another device. Let me just use another device. I'm just connecting with my phone. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Let me just uh, repeat that. Uh, as we wait for Emmanuel, I'm kindly I'm... requesting RSC Bashir and RSC Edisa to kindly share with us their email. If at all the participants have further questions or would want to interact further with their questions via emails, please kindly assist us with your emails via the chat such that we can be able to reach out to you. Thank you so much. Yes, Jesus, can you hear me loud and clear? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Jesus. I hope I'm clear. I, I would want any feedback from the members in case I'm very loud and clear now. Donald, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes, hear, we you. can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, my apologies for the delays. I just wanted to make sure this time um, my internet is still. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I want to first start appreciating the mass team. That's uh, the entire team led by the president, Mr. Donald. Thank you so much for organizing this webinar. And as I had earlier stated, is that uh, this is a whole topic that is, of course, going on in the news and in the media. And it's something I personally have been pondering on. I'm wondering what some of the things or issues that are causing, you know, all the issues in land. Now, Mario land is on the table. And I think, uh, I do believe the panelists that were the guest speakers did great justice to the topic, taking us through from the genesis of how the entire, from 1900 to the present. And I want to give a round of applause to Mr. Bashir Chizito and, uh, and Mr. Idris Kabuswa for taking your time to take us through this very topic. And I want to thank you so much for taking, again, for 
deliberate, you know, I understand maybe you have busy schedules, but you manage to be there in time because as though I, I joined a few minutes late, I realized that the speakers were on board. I also want to thank also my other colleagues that managed to be part of this webinar. Uh, it has been over two hours, but uh, I also realized the questions were quite enormous from the people and I see it was quite engaging. Thank you so much. And uh, we hope to have more of these engagements and uh, I think we can all have a blessed day and a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, due, to, due to time, I think let's conclude. I hope you've all had Emmanuel's vote of thanks. So in conclusion, I would like to appreciate RSU Edwisa and RSU Bashir. We are very, very, very great. We are more than grateful for your time and for the knowledge you have provided to us. Yeah, we have, we have obtained so much knowledge about the past, the current, and the future state of the mile land. And we appreciate that all due to the fact that you spare your time and you've given us the knowledge. We thank you so much. We pray that the good Lord may bless you for us. So that's all we can do for now. I thank you so much. I'll call upon the president of MASH to conclude the session. Thank you very, very much. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, our moderator, once again, to your generals uh, for taking us through this session. Yes, once again, I'm Donald Chidibarwanya, the president of uh, MAS, Makai Association of Serving Students. Yes, to our speakers, that is um, Mr. Chizito Bashir and uh, RSU Edwisa Kadiswa, we are so much uh, humbled to for having you at uh, this webinar and uh, for sharing with us uh, uh, the knowledge about uh, this sort of topic that has been uh, going around. Yes, we are so much humbled. And to our participants, we appreciate it. It's, yeah, it's been a two-hour session and uh, all of you, you've stayed up to the call. Up to, the, up to this time, you've stayed on the call. We appreciate you so much. Uh, for making it to this webinar. We, uh, we also appreciate our patron, that is, uh, that is uh, Professor Moses Musinguzi, uh, he's the patron of MAS, uh, for always uh, engaging us with, uh, with, uh, with the professionals and also always advising us on uh, all these issues. Then uh, I want to appreciate the cabinet as well for always um, uh, standing up to these occasions and uh, contributing towards uh, the goals of the association. I appreciate the cabinet as well so much. Yes, thank you very much everyone for attending this webinar. I wish you a blessed day ahead. Thank you and a good afternoon. I will uh, hand over to Jen Rose uh so that we can conclude yes i will uh, request the volunteer to give us a closing prayer as we wind up this session any volunteer on the call to give to lead us in a closing prayer, then we conclude. Any volunteer on the call to lead us in a closing prayer, then we close up the session.
Okay, the volunteer is here. Uh, we are praying. Father, we thank you for the enlightenment that we have had. As future professionals, we pray that we use the information rightly to help communities and the nation at large. We pray for our presenters that you bless them, O King of Glory and the President and everybody who is in this profession. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. Amen. Yes, thank you. You might leave whenever you want. Thank you.